Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea, and I'm an educator here at Reed Park Zoo in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we're going to get started um, right now, but I do want to go over some housekeeping things for this session. I want to let you know that this session is being recorded. So for any reason you need to hop off or you'd like to watch it again, um, or if you want to watch previously recorded sessions, you can go to readparkzoo.org to access any um, recorded sessions. Another uh, thing to keep in mind is that we're going to be using the chat function uh, during today's webinar. We have the chat set up so that it only comes to Read Park Zoo panelists, so the presenters. You will not be able to chat with one another. But if you want to take a moment right now and locate your chat function, you can let us know who you are and tell us what maybe your favorite animal is. And again, Reed Park Zoo is located in Tucson, Arizona. Today it's supposed to get 100 degrees, so we're hitting summer here pretty quick. All right, perfect. So you seem to be finding the chat, um, which is great. Um, and we're noticing some people putting in sloth as their favorite animal. And some other animals are coming in now as well. Perfect. So we're going to be doing the Zoo to You online classroom today about amazing animal adaptations. I think we're ready to get started. So what is an animal adaptation? So adaptations are features that an animal has on its body or a behavior that it does that helps it survive in its habitat. Um, so it helps it get food, water, or shelter. And habitats or adaptations are things uh, that develop over a very long period of time. It's usually a reaction to something that's happening in the ha habitat, and it gives the animal an advantage to be able to survive there. So what is an animal adaptation? How do you know when an animal has an adaptation? So you can make observations, and that's what scientists do uh, consistently. Um, and some observation skills that you might use are your eyes. Um, using your eyes is a great way to see what an animal's doing, um, and you're able to do it safely. So if you're able to watch an animal from far away, that's going to be best. Um, and you can use tools like binoculars to help you see an animal that's farther away and make it look closer. Um, some other tools you might want to have are a journal or a notebook, so you can document what you're seeing or draw a picture of the animal and write down anything that you might notice. So you also want to have a pen or markers, crayons, and things like that. Some other things to keep in mind when you're observing animals is pay attention to the smells that are around you. An animal may be reacting to a smell that's happening in the habitat, um, giving more insight to the adaptations that that animal has. Another thing to keep in mind is using your sense of hearing to so your ears. You can listen for sounds that are going on around the habitat and an animal might be reacting to those sounds as well. So once you start making those observations and noticing things about animals, you can start to ask yourself questions like, I wonder why that animal is behaving that way, or I wonder why that animal uses its body in a certain way, or what is that on an animal's body? Those are all um, adaptations and you can start to learn more about them. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So here's a picture of a flamingo. So in your chat function, if you want to notice something about the flamingo, you can go ahead and put that in the chat. And while you are doing that, I can tell you a little bit more about this flamingo. So at Reed Park Zoo, we have Chilean flamingos and they're located currently over by our Conservation Learning Center. Chilean flamingos are from South America and they live in the Atacama Desert. It's actually a pretty harsh environment, uh, but the flamingos seem to thrive there and do very well. So some of the adaptations that you're noticing, um, somebody put that it's standing on one leg and that is an excellent observation. So flamingos do stand on one leg and the great thing about um, the adaptations is we're always learning more. So scientists have an idea that flamingos actually stand on one leg because it's easier for them. So if you're watching from home or wherever you are, if you wanna get up out of your seat and stand up, we invite you to try to stand on one leg. Think, is it easier for you to stand on one leg or is it easier for you to stand on two? We have to uh, think about balance and things like that when we're standing on one leg, but scientists believe that it's actually easier for a flamingo to stand on one leg and that's why you see them in that pose uh, frequently. 
Another thing about the flamingo are the webbed toes, and I saw someone notice that. So they do have the webbed feet like our duck and swan friends that helps them swim. So uh, flamingos actually can swim quite well. So if you are still standing, you can go ahead and stomp your feet. That's actually something that flamingos will do with their webbed toes as well on top of swimming. And when they're stomping in the water, what they're doing is mixing up the mud um, and it helps mix up the little crustaceans and some of the algae that lives in the lakes. And then they're gonna use another adaptation, which is their curved beak. So they'll dip their head into the water and kind of move it back and forth and they can filter out those crustaceans um, without getting any of the mud. And that is how they eat their food. And uh, the crustaceans like shrimp are gonna be some of their favorite foods and it's actually how they get their pink color. All right, so let's try another animal. So um, in your chat function, if you want to make some observations, what do you notice about this anteater? And this is another animal that we have at Reed Park Zoo. This is a giant anteater. And believe it or not, there's different kinds of anteaters or different species. This is a giant anteater. They're found in Brazil in the Cerrado habitat, which is kind of like a grassland. And we have these um, animals in our South American section of Reed Park Zoo. And so some of you are making great observations uh, about its long nose, the hairy tail. That is really great. So yes, the tail is actually one of my favorite things to talk about with giant anteaters. If you look at the tail, it's actually almost the same length as their body. And what they'll do is they'll dig a little hole in the ground and they'll lay in the hole and then flop their tail over on top of them, kind of like a blanket because it does get a little bit cool at night. And so the, all that hair on their tail keeps them warm, but it also camouflages them. So they are able to blend in with the ground and the surrounding environment and makes it harder for predators to see them. So that tail comes in very useful for their survival. It also can help protect them from predators because uh, anteaters will actually stand on their hind legs and use their tail to prop up and balance so that they can show their claws. And if you take a look at the picture, they have those really incredible claws and they can then uh, try to scare off a jaguar by slashing at that jaguar. So pretty intimidating animals um, with those claws. Um, some of you noticed the long nose. Um, so the long nose is actually their top jaw and they have a bottom jaw that is fused to the top jaw so they can't open their mouth very wide their mouth only opens to about the size of a quarter so about that big but inside their mouth they have a really long skinny tongue that's two feet long so if you took two rulers and stuck them end to end that is how long a uh, anteater's tongue is, and they use their tongue to slurp up to 30,000 ants and termites every single day. So their diet is mostly insects, and so they're called an insectivore because they're eating that many insects every single day. They have those incredible claws that we were mentioning before that they use for protection from predators. They also need their claws for the food because termites uh, make big mounds or big hills um, and they can be quite strong, but an anteater can poke their claw into the termite mound, kind of rip it open a little bit, and then use their tongue to slurp up those ants and termites. And because their claws are so important for their protection, but also for their food, they need to make sure they're really sharp. So you'll see the anteaters in the picture, they walk on their knuckles, keeping those uh, claws nice and sharp and ready for when they need to use them. And another thing that I love to talk about with giant anteaters is that shoulder stripe. So that stripe is really important, especially when anteaters are babies. A baby anteater is called a pup, and the pup will actually ride around on its mother's back, piggyback style. And when the pup is riding on the mom's back, the shoulder stripe lines up with the mother's stripe and it helps them camouflage or blend in with the mother. It makes it hard for a predator to tell that there's a baby riding around on top and that helps keep that baby safe as they're growing um, and becoming a big strong anteater themselves. Awesome. So here's another animal. This animal um, is another one that you can make an observation about. So in your chat, if you want to uh, say something that you notice about this zebra. Another species that we have at Reed Park Zoo, these are Grevy zebra. It's a type of zebra and they are found in Eastern Africa. And they live in a shrubland, which is a really dry habitat with a little bit of grass, small plants and bushes. So it's called a shrubland um, and zebras do very well there. 
So some of the adaptations that you are noticing, of course, those big, beautiful stripes. So zebra stripes are just like your fingerprints. So if you take a second to look at your finger, you can see all those little lines that you have on your finger. Those are your fingerprints. And every single one of you has an individual fingerprint. Nobody else has a print just like yours. That is the same thing with zebras. So zebra stripes are like their fingerprints and every single zebra has a different pattern. And scientists who study zebras in the wild can actually look at the stripe pattern to tell individual zebras apart. Um, the other theory or idea about the zebra stripes is scientists are continually learning about animals. They think that the stripes help confuse predators. Zebras live in herd groups, so they live together. And when a group of them is together, it's hard to tell where one zebra ends and where the next zebra begins. So that might help confuse predators. It also um, is thought that it helps confuse uh, biting insects like mosquitoes so they don't get bitten as often because of their stripe pattern. Uh, you can see in the picture here that our zebra is eating grass. So the way an animal eats is an adaptation. And so if you're living in an area where there's a little bit of grass and some brush, um, that might be a useful tool to be an herbivore or a plant eater. They have square flat teeth in their mouth to be able to rip up the grass and the leaves and uh, chew them up to get the nutrients out of those um, plants. And another feature about grevy zebras that I love to talk about are their big ears. To me, they're kind of like big rounded Mickey Mouse ears. So you guys can put on your zebra ears. And the one thing about them is their ears can uh, swivel in different directions and independently from one another. And they're going to be using their ears for listening for predators like lions or hyenas or other predators that might be trying to sneak up on them. So having those ears that can move in different directions is a really great way uh, to help them stay alive and safe. Awesome job. So you guys have learned a lot about observing animals and thinking about what an animal has on its body and how it uses its body. Um, and so that's a really great way to start investigating the world that you have right around you. So right outside your window, there are birds and insects and lizards, and even the plants around you have adaptations. So you can start to look at the world in a new, exciting way and start thinking about those adaptations and make new discoveries um, that help us out all the time. So uh, we want you to stay alert out there, stay safe um, and have fun. And we look forward to having you at the zoo again soon. Thank you so much for attending our zoo to you online classroom today. We'll be able to answer questions. A reminder that this session was recorded so you can watch it again um, or you can access previously recorded sessions at our website at readparkzoo.org. And we'd love to hear from you. You can connect with us at uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, but now we can answer questions. And Jen um, might pop back on to help answer some questions um, and we'll filter it through the chat. So if you do have questions, you can enter that now in our chat function. But thanks so much for joining us. Um, one of the questions was, um, do lemurs have adaptation since we have a lemur on the screen? So I don't know if you wanted to do a quick um, lemur adaptation. Yep. So again, using our observation skills, you can see our lemur here is kind of clinging to a tree. And so they have excellent climbing adaptations. They're going to be living in and around the treetops. So they have hands and feet that are both designed for grabbing onto things. So their hands and their feet are their adaptations. They have that beautiful long tail um, that helps them with balance so they don't fall out of the trees because they're moving very quickly. Um, and so they can use that tail to help balance as they're moving through the trees. Absolutely. Great, great question. And somebody asked if they have great eyesight. They do. Um, and that's what's going to help them to be able to tell distances between the trees and help them be able to explore their world. They are really well adapted to life in the trees. And so having good eyesight is going to be very helpful to them. So Andrea, your next question is about peacocks. And it is, um, why do boy peacocks have colorful feathers? Ah, so peacocks are really great because the males have those big, beautiful eye spots and the big, beautiful tails that they'll fan open. And uh, during a, a certain time of the year, when they're looking to pair up with a female so they can get ready to have babies, they'll actually spread out their tail and do a little dance. And that's hopefully to uh, find a mate that they can um, be with. So uh, the males have those big, beautiful tails. 
females don't need those big, beautiful tails because when they lay their eggs, they don't want to get a, a attention from predators that might want to eat those eggs. And so they're more of a tan color so they can lay on the ground and blend in or camouflage and keep those babies safe. So we'll see that a lot of times in the bird species where the males or the boys have the really flashy feathers and the females are usually a more um, uh, tame color to help them blend in and protect their young. Great question. And we have time for one more question. I think that um, we have Katie asking about giraffes and their different spots. If we can tell the giraffes apart from their different spots. Absolutely. So just like zebras, um, the giraffe's spot pattern is uh, unique to them. So you can tell the giraffes apart. Um, at Reed Park Zoo, um, our two giraffes um, have kind of a similar spot pattern, but if you look closely, they are a little bit different. And it has to do with the lines in between the spots and how thick those lines are. So it can vary um, to help us uh, tell them apart. Great question. All right, so we want to thank you all for joining us today or joining Andrea and I. And um, I know that we have more questions coming in and we're able to answer online. So if you do have other questions, we'd love to hear from you. So please um, um, email us at education at readparkzoo.org. I know we have some classrooms that are participating. So um, we'd love to connect with you. Um, and hopefully when um, we can reopen the zoo and everything is safe to go out and about again, um, hopefully we all get a chance to see you at the zoo as well. So we wanna thank you for joining us and um, hopefully you'll tune in to our next class, which will be next Thursday, either at 11 or two o'clock. So we will see you soon. Thanks for joining. Bye, thank you so much.